thank you very much for doing this, Gabor, and, and welcome. And, and, and I, am I pronouncing that correctly? Do you, is that how you, you pronounce that? Uh, you will never learn to pronounce it properly, <laughs> but it's, okay. it's, it's Gabor, yes. Gabor, okay. And, and you're, what part of the world you're located where exactly? I'm located in uh, Hungary. That's what I thought. That's it's what I believe. Central Eastern Europe. Thank you. Um, I have uh, been following you now on Twitter for quite a while, and you have quite a uh, quite a bit of insight into a number of things, you know, physiology. And I want to discuss a few of those if you if you if you're okay with that. Um, can you just give us a little bit of your background for people that aren't familiar with you? Yeah, my education, higher level education, is in molecular biology. I graduated in the 90s, so I'm kind of a old school molecular biologist. That was in the um, the era when, uh, for example, PCR started to become uh, mainstream. Um, it's, it's used every day these days in the, the viral pandemics. So it's very interesting to follow these debates on this. Um, and um, after graduation, uh, I have a master's. I've become for a short while a medical sales representative in surgical devices. That was a rather interesting detour. And uh, then I uh, worked uh, later worked in um, uh, product management and uh, technical support for surgeons. Uh, even later, I worked in industrial enzymes, uh, enzymes for industrial applications, you know, the washing powders and these kind of things. And also the, the main area I covered was actually uh, converting starch into alcohol and uh, these uh, sugar syrups, which everybody loves in low carb uh, circles. So I have a background to uh, I have a background in uh, making these uh, high fructose corn syrups even and even cheaper and more accessible to to everybody. That happened uh, some I don't know 10, 15 years ago. And then I've, uh, I've, I worked as a uh, industrial technology specialist, that's uh, technology support for the same uh, producers in, in, uh, in the industry, um, applying biotechnology to these uh, food uh, production processes. And uh, then I actually, for a couple of years, I worked in a alcohol and uh, high fructose corn syrup producer. Uh, optimizing and food applications. And uh, for the last couple of years, I've worked as an R&D consultant, uh, both in industry and in uh, supporting some startups in uh, metabolic uh, profiling, for example. And um, yeah, I'm, occasionally I uh, give uh, lifestyle advice uh, if people have uh, difficult to solve uh, issues which uh, the medical establishment um, doesn't really deal with. Uh, and I try to look into, I do some uh, research, quite some reading and try to come up with uh, something useful to support uh, these guys with, with some difficulties. Yeah, I mean, it's obvious you do quite a bit of lead, reading in the literature if you follow your Twitter feed. I mean, you just, you know, every post is some sort of study that you talked about, and there's hundreds and hundreds of them. I, you know, as someone, I was in medical school in the early 90s, uh, and I remember uh, the late 80s, I guess, early 90s initially, and I, I do remember some of the PCR being talked about. I think it was in either a, maybe in a biochemistry and immunology class. I can't remember what we learned about it, but I, I remember hearing about that ages ago as well. I want to just, uh, you know, kind of looking through some of the stuff you've covered over, you know, maybe the recent year or so. I mean, I, I certainly, I think we should maybe talk a little bit about uh, some of the virology and immunology and the, and the testing. And I think that's, that, that's interesting, but I'd like to maybe, if, if, if you don't mind, pick your brain. I know you had a nice, interesting discussion on a couple of topics. And so one TMAO, which has been talked about as the you know, another reason to not eat meat, and I know you you, you kind of look through some of the research on that and have a have a have an impression on what 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 TMAO may or may not mean, and uh, uh, perhaps we can talk um, a little bit about incretins because I know you've got some some level of uh, working knowledge about incretin hormones, and then perhaps maybe a little about the lipid stuff, and then maybe finish out with uh, a discussion on the current stuff that everybody likes to talk about is some of this virology and the testing and immunology. So. Are you okay to talk on those topics? Is that okay? 
Fine, perfectly fine, yes. Okay, so let's let's talk about TMO, trimethylamine oxide. What is it? Why is it bad for us? Why maybe it not be bad for us? What is it? What, you know, should I not be eating meat? Should I be scared to eat meat because of TMAO like the, 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 the sort of the vegan doctors tell me to be? Uh, TMA is a metabolite of uh, some uh, stuff found mainly in animal products. And um, yeah, I, I know the, the literature um, which uh, kind of attacks uh, these metabolites and uh, tries to uh, yeah, give a bad rap to, to these uh, compounds. Um, my understanding is that uh, uh, actually the, the uh, physiological effect, the, the adverse effect, what, what some of these can have, uh, are not really well established. So um, when we talk about uh, TMA and TMAO, uh, TMA is uh, usually what comes from the gut microbiota. So it's a, it's a microbe metabolite of uh, creatinine and these kind of things, uh, uh, phosphatidyl choline and, and uh, coming in with, uh, with the diet, mainly from animals, for example, egg yolks, meat are rich in, in these uh, compounds. And then uh, the, uh, the microbiota, some, some bacteria in our guts uh, can uh, convert these to TMA, uh, which is an intermediate, and then uh, the, the liver uh, oxidizes it uh, to TMAO. So that's the basic uh, physiology. And um, what uh, actually needs to be established, which of these compounds is harmful, if, if at all. And uh, uh, recent uh, evidence has kind of been turning uh, the, the understanding from TMAO being harmful to TMA uh, being harmful. So it's, it's, the, it's, it's most likely the uh, microbial intermediate, which can have uh, adverse uh, effects on our cardiovascular system, for example. It seems that TMAO has very limited effects uh, at all, in, in humans at least. Uh, so uh, that could uh, explain why, for example, fish can uh, always come out uh, as, as healthy in any kind of uh, epidemiology and, and uh, other meats seem to be unhealthy. And uh, how, how is it possible when, for example, meat is already very high in TMAO? Uh, it's kind of a kind of uh, perplexing, but if, 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 if it's not TMAO, uh, which is um, harmful, then it explains everything. So you can eat your fish and have your TMAO crossing your system because it's, uh, it's only temporarily uh, retained in the body and um, excreting it is, is not an issue. When, it, when excreting it becomes an issue, uh, that means that you have uh, kidney problems. Then it starts becoming a marker of, uh, of problems, but that's, that's a marker of kidney problems. That's a different uh, problem. That's when uh, you have advanced uh, diabetes, for example, or you had a um, kidney injury. So that's when TMAO uh, starts to become a marker of uh, of, the, of disease, but it's not actually a mediating compound of of, the, of that disease. So I think uh, these details are quite important to understand. If, and if uh, anybody is interested in uh, TMA TMAO uh, metabolism, I have a rather long uh, Twitter thread uh, on this. Uh, started compiling, um, I don't know, one or two years ago. And now it's uh, 15, 20 uh, posts uh, uh, linked uh, together. And uh, I think it contains most of the useful information, most of the useful studies, which show that uh, uh, TMA is a much more likely candidate for being a harmful compound. And TMAO, if it's a, a associated with disease at all, then uh, it's not the mediating compound, but, but only a marker of uh, kidney problems. Yeah, and so I mean, just and, I, and I've read that thread, and I, I thought one of the interesting conclusions. Uh, so what we're saying is, you know, fish has, is high in TMAO just, you know, naturally. So when you eat it, you're ingesting TMAO. It's 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 being, your our body's being exposed to it, but it doesn't appear to be harmful. Uh, if we do see elevated TMAO levels, it may be a marker of disease somewhere, and this is just a surrogate. It's not actually causative, but TMA potentially 
which is being acted upon by gut bi microbiota. Now, one of the things you say is, you know, I can eat, maybe I eat a food that will, that can be converted into TMA. Uh, however, if my gut microbiome is not dysbiotic, then I won't have as much produced. Is that, is that, I think one of the, one of the conclusions was TMA production in the gut may be a sign of gut dysbiosis, not the food you're feeding it. Is that fair yeah. to say? Yeah, that's, that's basically correct, uh, I believe. And uh, it has two, two aspects. Uh, one is uh, that what kind of diet can cause uh, the problem when you have excessive production of TMA in, in your gut. That's certainly not a meat heavy diet. Uh, so uh, you need uh, refined carbohydrates uh, in order to uh, establish a dysbiotic small intestinal um, microbiota, first of all, and and the other one is that uh, when you have when you are on a meat heavy uh, diet or low in uh, refined carbohydrates, for example, then uh, your your microbiota uh, becomes kind of uh, supportive and it it won't produce uh, so much TMA because uh, the the species uh, in higher abundance can further metabolize uh, TMA. So TMA remains a uh, intermediary uh, compound in your gut, and it's not um, absorbed in, in high amounts in, in that case, in that scenario. Yeah, and that has interesting implications to me because when I think about you know, some of the epidemiology around disease and say even, even colorectal cancer, and the associations we've seen epidemiologically with red meat, it could be that if we have a gut by, you know, gut biota that has been set up from a standard American diet, refined carb diet, and then you add meat into that situation, that may be the problem, not the meat itself. And it may be the situation that's being put into, and that might explain some of the confounding and some of the epidemiology. Do you think there's any, is that, is that a valid thought? Yeah, that's, that's exactly the same with, uh, with saturated fats and, and fats. So when you have a, when you have a problem, uh, already in the gut and usually sustained by by a refined diet. So we, we, we shouldn't stick to refined carbohydrates. I mean, uh, refined seed oils and, and different uh, aspects of, of refining, uh, especially industrially refining uh, foods uh, can cause problems uh, with your microbiota. And when you have these problems already existing in, in, in the gut, then adding more fats and uh, adding uh, more meat, for example, more of these compounds, and then you have a higher conversion rate or a higher absorp absorption, which is the case for fats supporting the, uh, the absorption of uh, lipopolysaccharides, you know, the, the outer wall uh, constituents of, of gram-negative bacteria. So this is again inflammatory, but uh, look at the, 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 the precise context to understand what the, what the real problem is. So uh, when you have a high refined carbohydrate and, and high fat, higher uh, meat, higher animal products, especially uh, um, refined uh, or, or highly processed uh, products, then uh, you increase uh, the, this inflammatory signaling. But it's, it's not solely due to consuming the meat or fat part. It's, uh, it's, it's the combination. Yeah, I think that makes sense what we see clinically. Um, speaking of refined carbohydrates, let's, let's transition over to the incretin hormone. So we've got GIP, which also is sometimes called uh, GI, glucose-dependent insulin tropic peptide, I believe, and then uh, GLP-1. And there's a GLP-2, but I don't, I don't think there's much done on GLP-2. At least I'm not familiar with much, much of a, much of a function. I'm sure there's a function, but it's not as well understood perhaps, or, or it doesn't seem to infect it. So what do they do? What's the significance of our incretins and how does the, and how does a type of diet impact us either positively or negatively with regard to incretins? I think uh, there are at least uh, two different uh, functions uh, of these uh, hormones. Um, one is to, to properly stimulate uh, pancreatic islet, islet hormones, so insulin and glucagon. Um, and and, the, and uh, even others. And the other one is uh, to provide um, signals uh, for our immune system in the gut. So these are very closely intertwined. And uh, this is uh, partly, this is one part of the, the newly emerging uh, science field called Im immunometabolism, which uh, we, because uh, we, we realized a couple of years or even a decade ago, ago that uh, uh, these two 
parts of physiology, Im immunology, the immune system and metabolism uh, are really closely uh, connected. And uh, one can influence the other in a profound way, but it's also true the other, the, the other way around. So um, what happens when you eat uh, basically any food is that you stimulate these hormones in, in your uh, small intestines. And uh, it, it occurs that uh, the, the, the distribution of these hormones is not even. So um, the, the two types of hormones are distributed very differently in, in the gut. In the duodenum, the starting part of, of the small intestines, uh, both have uh, a lot of uh, secreting or sensory cells. These, call, these are called K cells and L cells. Um, these uh, these uh, enteroendocrine hormone secreting cells in the gut are usually depicted with a, with a capital letter. And uh, by, by the time scientists arrived uh, to, to the discovery of uh, these uh, GIP and GIP hormones, uh, we were at, already at the K and L. So it's um, uh, it's not not exactly like that, but it's a little bit of uh, funny history. So um, what happens is that uh, further down uh, in the intestines, these uh, hormones are uneven. Uh, these uh, hormone secreting cells are unevenly distributed. So um, uh, the the GIP uh, secreting K cells are more abundant uh, in the proximal, in the upper small intestines, while uh, the L cells secreting GLP-1 and 2 and, and, and other hormones are more abundant in the further so-called distal uh, part of the, of the small intestines. So it, it creates an environment when, uh, when you eat an evolutionarily uh, appropriate food, which is uh, usually difficult to digest, it stimulates all these hormone secreting cells all the way down. So you get some early response and then you get uh, in time uh, some, some uh, late response. And then you have a kind of a balanced uh, response. Uh, early on, more uh, GIP is, is secreted. Uh, it gives a, a quick boost to, to insulin, for example. And um, later on, uh, um, uh, this GIP uh, one is uh, secreted, and it, it 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 can also stimulate insulin to a, a smaller extent, but it can also uh, block uh, the action of uh, glucagon, which is uh, probably more important. And then there is the 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 um, direct stimulation of uh, nerve endings in in the gut and uh, interaction with immune cells. So it's it's quite complex, but uh, to to dumb it down a little bit. Uh, this balanced response changes in a very profound way as soon as you start refining your your food. So the quicker the, di the digestion, the quicker the dumping of food from the stomach to the small intestines, the more imbalanced this uh, hormone secretion uh, becomes. For example, it's, uh, there are very old studies uh, already showing this. Uh, of course, uh, at, before the, the discovery of these hormones, uh, uh, we could only monitor uh, insulin and, and uh, glucagon the, the, and, and blood glucose. But already from the insulin response, it's very often uh, obvious that there is, there is something wrong going on. And there is a, a study from 1977, so it's, uh, it's not as old as, as we are, but, uh, but not, 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 too, not much younger. Um, not much more recent, that uh, showed uh, that during apple processing, when you eat a whole apple or you eat apple in a pureed form or you, in, or you drink apple juice and all the nutrients are the same because the, the, the whole apple is processed. So all the fiber is in, uh, all, all, the, all the sugar is in, all the water is in. They even, the, the authors even uh, corrected for, for uh, cons consumption time. So they, they uh, instructed the, the participant to consume the, the liquids uh, slowly so that uh, it, it equals the, the time of eating the apple. And what, what they observed was that there was a very quick uh, increase in, in glucose um, along with the, the level of uh, processing and also in, in, in the insulin response. So uh, compared to those who, who ate the whole apples, those who consumed 
the the prey or or the especially the juice uh their their glucose and insulin shot up uh, uh very early and uh, the insulin response was so exaggerated that uh that the glucose went down below baseline after 90 120 minutes so there was a marked uh, so-called postprandial hypoglycemic episode which which uh, can manifest in in uh, in uh, some symptoms like a carb craving for example um and and uh, and other um symptoms and uh, much much later only a couple of uh, years ago this was uh, related to the the increased secretion of another gut hormone called ghrelin which is also called the hunger hormone explaining that uh, when when your glucose is dropping very fast after a huge in insulin response the, uh, the 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 secretion of uh, ghrelin the hunger hormone in the gut uh, shuts up and this uh, kind of crossing uh, trajectory uh, causes a sudden panic hunger feeling in the brain. And you need both for this uh, panic hunger. If you only only uh, add the, the ghrelin intravenously, you, you don't have the you don't see the, the response. And also, uh, if if uh, the ghrelin response is absent, only the glucose um, drop is observed there is no such response uh, in the brain so it's it's quite interesting that uh, we start um, finding the explanation for for very old observations uh, what happens and then i i uh, gave a a lecture a couple of years ago now it will be three years ago uh, on the effects of uh, food especially carbohydrate uh, processing you know i'm kind of a industri industrial expert of uh, turning uh, corn and, and wheat into alcohol and this uh, quick absorbing uh, syrups uh, and, and what happens uh, i was very very much interested in what happens uh, to to digestion to feelings of uh, of hunger and these kind of things and uh, gave a lecture a couple of years ago exactly uh, on on this and my my final conclusion was that uh, the the single um underlying mechanism of uh, of uh, starting uh, metabolic uh, problems is the rate of appearance of uh, simple sugars in the small intestine so uh, and and the rate this determines basically the rate of absorption so if you have uh, accelerated uh, dumping of these quick sugars uh, to the to the small intestine uh, you will see a accelerated uh, absorption of uh, the sugars and uh, there is an interestingly a reinforcing uh, response uh, by the body to this um, and and uh, people can become uh, glucose absorbing machines more or less so uh, it's it's a kind of a catch-22 this, this can only be broken if you can slow down uh, the absorption of, of this glucose and uh, there are some very interesting mechanisms or studies uh, regarding uh, this, um, one of my favorites is uh, the the weird, na naturally also existing sugar, which is called uh, isomaltulose. It's uh, basically one molecule of glucose and one molecule of fructose, so it's very similar to sucrose uh, or table sugar. It's exactly the same chemical. Um, chemically there is only one difference uh, the binding of the two uh, compounds the two sugars occurs at the different uh, carb carbon atoms so it's 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 it has a little little bit of different uh, configuration so you would think that and, and it, it can be 100% uh, broken down by the body so it's it's metabolized 100% uh, absorbed 100% what you see when you consume the good old uh, table sugar sucrose or saccharose, uh, what, and, and you consume isomaltulose, there is a profoundly different effect on our physiology. Uh, Japanese um, uh, substitute 50% of uh, table sugar with this uh, isomaltulose uh, sugar, and uh, they see some reversing of diabetes. So this, this is rather weird. And actually what, what you can... Uh, get out of these uh, these studies is that uh, what happens in the small intestines is that uh, due to the different 3d configuration of uh, of the uh, sugar uh, 
molecules. I mean, the two sugar sugars. It's called the disaccharide because it consists of two sugars. Uh, the 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 different uh, uh, 3D configuration of these uh, disaccharides uh, creates a different um, enzymatic enzymatic breakdown speed. So changing a little bit the 3D configuration of uh, of the sugar makes uh, the sugar uh, worse substrate for the sugar uh, hydrolyzing enzyme, which means that uh, it, it's, it's uh, released much more evenly in the small intestine, much more slowly. When you eat this uh, isomaltulose, a uh, little bit of sugar is released uh, in the upper part, but uh, the, the, the remaining uh, majority of the sugar is released gradually as it passes down in your in your small intestines so and what you see is the the oppo opposite response uh, the the one sugar can create uh, diabetes or, or metabolic disease and the other one can cure it it's i think it's uh it's it's the simplest way of uh, of looking that uh, at the very core uh, the problem at the, at the very core of uh of uh, the metabolic diseases. So I, my, one of my favorite examples, and, and when somebody starts bashing fructose, for example, uh, I always bring up uh, this, these two sugars, because uh, if it's only up to the sugar, then uh, how is it possible that uh, with, with such a small difference between two sugars, one causes the disease and the other one almost cures the disease? I mean, uh, both the, at the end of the day, uh, both um, 100 grams of uh, these sugars, 50 gram glucose, 50 gram fructose is, is absorbed by the body. So it should be metabolized in the very same way. But what happens is, is just the opposite. Yeah, so the, the, the fructose and the, uh, the glucose become absorbed in a different location in the gut. It's, it's I guess... Initially, when you said it, our natural diet is hard to digest, by that you mean it's slow to, to digest, is what I'm assuming. There's yes. a slow gastric yep. or, or you know, intestinal transit time because yes. we see that I think GIP can, GLP can can lead to delayed gastric emptying, which kind of slows things down. So we get this slow, steady uptake. Rather, as when you eat these refined foods, it's rapid, and we see rapid appearance of. Uh, and, and I, I, you know, my assumption is we see rapid transport through the gut and we get down to that ileum where that, where those, uh, I guess at the, where the L cells are hanging out and we get that precocious stimulation of GLP-1, I suppose, where, where it's being stimulated earlier than it should be. Is that, is that fair to say? Yeah, yeah, precisely. And, uh, and, uh, if you follow, if, if, you, if you recognize this very basic mechanism, mechanism, uh, you are able to formulate uh, your diet, even without changing the content, in a way which uh, removes uh, much of the harm. And uh, now this is also uh, recognized, for example, the Japanese uh, Diabetes Association, and they recommend to follow a certain food order. Because if you preload uh, with stuff which uh, slows down absorption or digestion, then uh, you remove the, the, this uh, very uh, adverse uh, effect of, of uh, quick absorbing uh, carbohydrates. So if somebody is not willing to change uh, his or her diet in a, in a profound way, uh, there, there is still something which that, that can be done. For example, eat, eat the salad, you know, the roughage uh, first, then the, the meat uh, and, and only eat the quick absorbing carbohydrates last. I think uh, this is all, this is also a, a uh, eating pattern or a, or a food order which was recognized basically centuries ago. If you have a look at some some societies, they have this uh, appetizer, main meal, and and uh, dessert uh, food order for for centuries, more or less. So um, I'm I'm still amused how our ancestors were able to to recognize the the, the beneficial ef effect of of uh, certain food orders, for example, on on uh, metabolic health without having the slightest clue of what what's happening in in the gut well i mean they they just live with it the, they probably maybe more effectively had to realize live with the consequences and not having to look at some minimary lab value which was meaningless to them i mean all i knew about how, is how they felt um i mean i guess it's fair to say that fat would be the slowest 
of the, of the, of the macronutrients that are going to be transported, followed by protein, followed by carbohydrates, particularly refined carbohydrates. So if we were to think about an order to, to, to eat and you, you put fiber in there first with the salad, but uh, you know, like I said, that's, I don't know what the gut transport time, well, how does fat, how does, how does, how does fiber impact gut motility? Does it slow it down? Does it speed it up? There, I guess it depends on the type of fiber too. I think it's, it's, it slows it slows down gastric emptying, and uh, that's that's basically. <laughs> I tend to I tend to believe that that's the the the, the biggest benefit of eating uh, roughage. So I don't eat uh, much myself because I can take care of uh, what I eat in, in, by other means. But uh, for example, I have a lot of friends in India, and I, I and I got a really great response uh, from them. Uh, in India, just eating keto, uh, it's it's extremely expensive. So not a, not a lot of people can afford still uh, eating keto, or or not to mention uh, carnivore. So it's uh, it's uh, it's not really an option. So what what you can do? Uh, when you are uh, on, a, on a very low budget, so you have to s uh, spare money on, on your food. S still, you can you can eat your roughage uh, first, then you eat your protein next, and then eat the rice or or whatever uh, last. And, and uh, you can even uh, play around with your rice, not eating the white but but brown rice, uh, cooking it and cooling it a couple of times to increase the to decrease the the, the speed of uh, enzymatic uh, breakdown and this kind of uh, things so so there is still a lot one can do and uh, diabetics from India um, uh, send me uh, regularly these uh, reports what, what kind of uh, they have a very good uh, response um, consultants uh, uh, share the, the, the experiences with their clients that uh, uh, they cannot afford or they don't want to do keto, uh, but but they can do this uh, food order and intermittent intermittent fasting and these kind of um, interventions much more easily, and uh, the, the the results are, are just uh, great. So you you kind of alluded to some of the confounders with saturated fats. So let's let's maybe transition over to talking about how do we think about lipids, fat, cholesterol, saturated fat. How do you sort of how do we sort of we have one camp saying that all fat is bad. We should we should be eating this minimally minimal fat as possible. And then there's other people on the keto side that eat unlimited fat. And there's probably some truth thereby, somewhat in in between. So, how, what is your thought on how we think about cholesterol, saturated fat, fat in general? I think that the the single biggest problem with uh, with biology, or rather with people uh, trying to in interpret biology, is ignoring context. So biology is, is hugely contextual because all living natures uh, have evolved to, to deal with a, a changing environment. So um, when, when people uh, lock themselves into a position that something is good and something is bad, uh, you can immediately uh, smell that, that something is fishy because they don't consider that uh, this can be um, problematic in one context, but it can be beneficial in, in another context. So uh, biology is hugely uh, contextu contextual. So um, bad and good and bad uh, can only um, have a have a meaningful interpretation if, if you understand the, the underlying uh, context. So uh, as we as we briefly uh, touched upon, uh, mixing uh, refined carbohydrates with fatty meats, for example. Yeah, that, that's a certain context when the fat can cause more problems. But is the fat the, the very root of, of all the problems, in, even in that context? I, I don't think so. So I, I have this uh, pet theory of uh, lipopolysaccharide uh, absorption. And uh, it's, it's even a little bit more uh, complex than that because not all lipopolysaccharides uh, were created, uh, are created equal. So uh, some of the gram-negative bacteria we harbor in our, in our gut and which uh, typically goes up on a ketogenic or, or carnivore uh, diet is uh, the, the so-called bacterial detus uh, film. And uh, these guys um, uh, produce also, uh, these, these are also gram-negative bacteria and produce uh, lipopolysaccharides. But actually what you observe 
is that uh, their inflammatory effect is minimal. So uh, what you see, they, they don't stimulate the same uh, inflammatory pathway the same way uh, as uh, some of the opportunistic uh, gram-negative uh, bacteria do in, in, in the gut. Those are also gram-negative gram and, and produce uh, lipopolysaccharides, but, but the effect on in inflammatory signaling is hugely different. Actually, if you have a very high amount of this uh, uh, um, polys uh, lipopolysaccharide, LPS, uh, which is not very inflammatory, it can even reduce inflammatory signaling from those bad uh, bacteria. And those really bad bacteria, uh, which, which uh, you know, E. coli and uh, Klebsiella, Yersinia, Enterobacter, these are the so-called Enterobacteriaceae uh, family of, of uh, bacteria. These are opportunistic uh, pathogens. And uh, these can overgrow, especially when uh, uh, fueled by uh, simple sugars. So you have the simple sugars, you have these uh, increasing abundance of these uh, opportunistic uh, pathogenic uh, bacteria, which produce these highly inflammatory uh, LPS, and then you add the fat on top. These, these RPS uh, molecules consist of uh, long sugar chains attached to a lipid core, so-called lipid A. And this lipid A is a, is a couple of saturated fats. So how the body sees it as a, as a saturated fat uh, with, with attached uh, special uh, sugars on, on top. And actually, uh, the body takes up uh, together with the dietary fat, these uh, LPS uh, molecules and, and uh, adds them into uh, chylomicrons, you know, the lipoproteins which carry um, the lipids uh, around in, in the body. So you take up more of these lipopolysaccharides in uh, two uh, contexts when you produce more uh, of these uh, lipopolysaccharides and when you eat more fat which uh, facilitate the absorption of um, the, the LPS. So uh, when you have high LPS and uh, high absorption, that's a very bad combination, uh, naturally. And th this is what happens when you help uh, the, the pathogenic uh, LPS producing bacteria overgrow and you add the, the fat on top and you increase the, the absorption. And then it's, it results in a very high um, inflammatory signaling. Now, what happens when you eat, for example, a carnivore uh, diet or a, a high-fat ketogenic diet, then actually you greatly suppress the uh, abundance of these uh, opportunistic uh, pathogenic bacteria. So even though you eat high fat, your LPS uh, levels in your small intestines will be low. So the overall absorption can still be low. So you, you absolutely miss the, the very high um, inflammatory signaling, especially uh, because uh, the, the, the aforementioned uh, bacteria detus uh, film, the, 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 the kind of good bacteria in this context, uh, produce a lot of uh, this non-inflammatory LPS, which can suppress even that little level of uh, low level of uh, bad LPS. I think that's the simplest way to put it, but uh, um, I have a feeling that this is uh, rather close to, to the problems of uh, many uh, diseases, uh, for example, uh, cardiovascular disease, but also uh, many uh, inflammatory diseases. Yeah, we're, and we're seeing a pr profound reduction in, in certainly inflammatory conditions with, with this style of eating, you know, in, in my experience. And I've got, you know, unfortunately, the exposure of thousands of people have done this now. Um, let's talk about, um, with the remaining time, um, some of the stuff around, uh, I guess, COVID-19, you know, we've got a vaccine that is being rolled out so several versions. People talk about herd immunity. The definition of herd immunity has been changed by the, uh, the World <laughs> Health Organization said, you know, you can get it through natural acquired immunity through exposure. And now that, that definition has been replaced with, you must do it through a vaccine, which I think is a little suspect, but, PCR cycling, there are people concerned about the number of cycle counts. We, we, it's the cycle threshold, you know, if it's 40, 40 cycles to amplify the signal so much that you get 
a viral particle, you may not be infectious at all. Is there asymptomatic spread? What, what are your, what, 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 talk about some of those topics because you've done extensive research on this stuff. Yeah, that's quite unfortunate, uh, in fact, because I had no plans to look into virology or, or uh, upper respiratory immunology or especially not into epidemiology, which uh, is one of the most hated science areas coming from nutritional ep epidemiology. That's, uh, that's uh, not even a science, uh, in my opinion. You know, I'm the I'm the kind of the mechanisms guy, so I I I prefer to look at problems in a way that I build a knowledge uh, up, up from 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 the bottom up and not from the top, uh, as as uh, these guys prefer to do it with with high level observations. So uh, yeah, I had unfortunately I had uh, quite some time last year to, to read a couple of hundreds of studies in virology and and, uh, and uh, the upper respiratory immunology and these kind of thing, things, even in the PCR. Um, I'm, I was kind of shocked a couple of times last year when uh, well-established uh, scientific uh, principles were overturned almost overnight. Uh, I found it uh, astonishing uh, how these herd immunity and and these uh, subjects were thrown around uh, continuously. And, and uh, um, I, I don't know, I, I'm not a conspiracy theorist, but uh, if you can uh, start with, with the PCR, for example, um, it's, it, it shouldn't be that uh, difficult. I mean, uh, PCR detects... Um, the the, the uh, nucleic nucleic acids DNA or RNA it it uh, detects the DNA but that's why it's uh, reversed uh, transcribed prior so uh, from from RNA DNA is created for the PCR and then it uh, in cycles it creates more and more DNA and then uh, there is a signal there is a visual uh, signal which makes uh, the, the sample positive. Or there is no signal, and then it's uh, it's negative. Um, how many cycles you run means that uh, how many times you you basically double the the signal. If you have, for example, ten copies of uh, of RNA in in the original sample, uh, you run one cycle, and then you will have uh, double the amount twenty. And then if you run two cycles, you will have uh, forty, and then then eighty, and so on and so forth. And uh, obviously, if you run 20, 25, 30, 35 cycles, you can uh, create a lot of uh, nucleic acids in the sample. And sooner or later, uh, there is, uh, if, if there was a positive, if there was a viral RNA in the original sample, then you will see a positive signal. So uh, what, what uh, happens is that the different uh, PCR machine manufacturers have a little bit uh, different uh, protocols how to actually run uh, the, the procedure in the lab, um, and uh, they can uh, they have dif they use different uh, chemicals, uh, different enzymes, uh, different temperatures, and so on and so forth. These these details are not very important. What is more important is that uh, uh, you can run the test up to I don't know 40, 45 cycles. Uh, it, it also doesn't matter, but where you where you create a line, a so-called threshold, uh, that's called the cycle threshold, when when after which or, or you consider uh, your result uh, positive, if there is a, if there is a positive signal, of course, if there is the color what you need, the, the color strength uh, you you require, and then you make a threshold that, for example. Uh, if it's uh, 30 or 35 cycles and there is a color, then my sample is uh, positive. So obviously, the higher the cycle threshold is, um, the, 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 the less um, RNA, um, viral uh, nucleic acids, were in the original samples because you double it in every single cycle. So that's, uh, that's how it works. And there has been a lot of debate where this uh, threshold should be set. And I think um, it 
can vary a little bit because the, the, the manufacturer's uh, protocols uh, are not the same. But uh, generally, uh, what we, at the end of the day, what we would like to see is that the, the person uh, who provided the sample is infectious or not. Uh, nobody cares if he was infectious two, three, ten weeks ago or if he will become infectious uh, whatever time, this, this cannot even be, uh, be told. So uh, I think um, there should be some agreement, uh, at least in every country, but all, probably also internationally, where this threshold is, is set. The most successful countries, for example, Taiwan and, and uh, Uruguay, they created their, their own protocols, their, their own PCR protocols, and they use a cycle threshold of 30. So uh, that's what they consider still uh, positive, which put meaning positive that uh, this person is likely to be infectious, because that's, that's what really matters, if you are infectious or not. So that's basically the, the CT. And uh, there are viral culture studies, which means that uh, from the same sample, uh, which the PCR is run uh, in, in, a, in a highly qualified and uh, safe lab, uh, researchers try, try to grow the actual virus in, uh, in uh, cell cultures. So that, uh, that is, uh, they, they look for the presence, the presence of, uh, of infectious virus, so-called live virus. And um, above the cycle threshold of 35, it's extremely rare to see live virus in these samples. So if you have a PCR positive of uh, 37, for example, it's, it's highly unlikely that uh, that person is positive. Now, there, 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 there are two uh, scenarios when, when uh, you can see this high cycle positive and you have very low viral load in your throat, basically. One is when, when you are not infectious anymore. So you had the infection one, two, three, sometimes even 12 weeks ago. Uh, people can still keep shedding these viral particles, these viral fragments. Uh, the other scenario is when you are not yet infectious. So you just got uh, the infection a couple of days ago and uh, you, you started producing already viral particles, but uh, not high enough, most likely, to be infectious yet. But in a couple of days, maybe already in, in one more day, you, you could be infectious. So how to uh, differentiate between these two? It's, it's rather easy. Uh, you could do uh, so-called uh, antigen quick testing, you know, this uh, kind of like the pregnancy uh, test uh, for, for uh, and, and for one for the cost of one PCR, you can do something like three quick tests. So you can monitor over time. These are less sensitive, which means that they only give a positive when you are actually infectious, when you have higher, higher viral load. But it can also be uh, done by running another PCR after uh, something like 40 hour, 48 hours later. So if you had a positive with a very high cycle threshold, uh, you can run another PCR in two days and see how it changes. If the cycle threshold goes down, for example, from 37 to 30, it means that you, you are shedding more viruses and you are most likely infectious now. So you were in a, in a pre-symptomatic phase uh, during the first measurement, and now you are in the most likely the symptomatic uh, phase. If the cycle threshold uh, doesn't change or even increases, for example, from the from the init initial 37 to 39, then you are becoming less infectious or, or much more likely that you were not infectious during the first uh, measurement and uh, you are getting out of this uh, past infection quickly. So you should be released from any kind of quarantine or, or whatever. Yeah, and so I guess that's a, that's a, the, the the fine line is to, to, to determine the, the quote unquote the pre symptomatics from the asymptomatics the people that yes. are no there that cannot be infectious. What is the uh, you know speaking of that, um, 
does there appear to be, I mean, my understanding is once you get a, you know, once you get a viral illness, you're, you're, you're likely to be immune from that. All that doesn't always hold to be true, but I don't think that a vaccine improves that likelihood. Although some people seem to think that is, I mean, it seems like there's some studies out there showing people that previously had the infection are now as immune as they're going to be. And then a vaccine's not going to necessarily improve upon that. Is that fair to say or no? Yeah. Over, over the last couple of weeks, uh, there were two large scale studies uh, published in, in peer reviewed uh, journals uh, that showed uh, it was in uh, healthcare workers in, in the UK that uh, those who had the, the, the PCR confirmed infection during the spring, last spring, uh, avoided uh, a symptomatic uh, disease during the second surge in the in the fall. Meaning, uh, and actually uh, that was uh, in both studies, 100%. So those people who were conf- confirmed to be uh, positive during the first um, surge or wave or whatever we, we call it, uh, were 100% protected from symptomatic disease uh, during the second surge, while their non-infected uh, counterparts during the first wave were uh, infected and uh, developed symptomatic disease by the hundreds um, uh, during the second wave. So it seems that uh, the the immunity... Uh, after infection is very robust. And in the initial cohort, the ones that were exposed, the initial healthcare, were, were they symptomatic as well or were they just PCR positives? Do, you, do we know if they... they, they... I think that uh, in both, uh, both uh, time windows, uh, the, the researchers chose to include uh, symptomatic um, persons only. That, that that's actually a good comparison to the vaccines because uh, the vaccine trials, at least the, the Pfizer and the Moderna, uh, also uh, picked only symptomatic disease as a, as a su- su- success uh, criteria. So uh, asymptomatic PCR positives were not even looked for. When they had uh, people with symptoms, then they confirmed the symptoms with PCR to see if, if that's, that, is, that was caused by uh, the, the coronavirus. So that's uh, exactly the same criteria uh, used by the vaccine trials and uh, the, um, this uh, uh, follow-up uh, natural immunity uh, studies. So it's, it's 100% comparable. Uh, there is a small difference, of course, in, in the study population because uh, healthcare workers uh, is not as heterogeneous a population what was used, uh, used uh, what was uh, included in, in the vaccine trials. But uh, very old people and, and uh, ill people were also excluded from, from uh, most vaccine trials. So I don't see a huge difference between the two, two groups. Uh, yeah, yeah, and that's my understanding for, for, well, quite honestly, for almost any vaccine or drug, they kind of include the people, exclude the people that are very vulnerable, the ones that will most likely theoretically at risk and would potentially benefit from that. So it's always interesting to see yeah, that. That's my, that's my uh, major kind of concern right now that many countries started vaccinating the elderly, uh, frail uh, elderly, uh, regardless of, uh, of uh, having a underlying disease, regardless of comorbidities. Uh, and this was not uh, examined uh, in, in, in the vaccine trials because they excluded anybody with comorbidities. So um, old people with comorbidities is an uncharted uh, territory with these vaccines. Well, and we we know that old people with comorbidities have the tendency to die a lot, you know? And so, you know, you could make the argument that the people that got a vaccine that were old and die a lot, they would have died anyway. And I think that'll be the argument. I won't be be popular uh, by saying, saying this, but you know that in many countries, the the, the definition of a COVID death is uh, dying uh, after being uh, diagnosed with a positive COVID test, dying within 28 or 30 days or, or whatever. So uh, I'm wondering if the same criteria will be set up for, for vaccine deaths. If, if somebody is vaccinated and dies within 28 days, is it a vaccine death or, or not? I so that, that's exactly the same criteria. I'm just uh, purely theoretically um, bringing this up that it's, it's not so straightforward. If uh, it, comparing apples to apples would be to 
Yeah. Um, just account any death to to the vaccine because that's what is being done for for the COVID deaths. Yeah, I mean that's the difference for, with dying from the disease with or with the, the disease. And I think if we did that with the vaccine and said yeah. all the old people that die. 30 days of having a vaccine were, were killed by the vaccine, there, there would be so much pushback from the manufacturers. Yeah, they can, be... they can die with the vaccine. But, but we, we, can, we could still count it. I mean, put up the counters and then let's see how it goes. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's like I, there was an analogy in, when I was in somewhere, medical school, surgical residency, they talked about the airline industry. And, you know, they were, they were cleaning up and really you know, trying to minimize deaths. And I said, well, if you put some of the people that we deal with in the hospital that are so sick on a plane, they probably would die too, <laughs> you know, just because they're already in such a bad situation. And it just happens to be if they're in the hospital because of that. If you stick them on a plane, they're probably going to die. Um, Gabor, I unfortunately have another meeting I've got to do. This has been wonderful. Hopefully, maybe we can bring you back and talk about, because I know there's just so many more topics we could get into. But um, where can people go to find out more of your information i know you're on twitter is there any other places that people can go to and what's your twitter handle yeah my twitter handle is uh g from gabor and then uh, erdosi from my um family name so it's uh, g e r d o s i and uh you can find me also on facebook i have a couple of facebook pages i have a page called lower insulin and also the the, the group uh, by the same name called uh, Lower Insulin. Um, there is nothing uh, profiteering uh, going on there. It's, uh, it's a science uh, study uh, analyzing uh, group. And um, yeah, basically that's all. I'm, I consult uh, small startups. If you search for my handles you, and if you are interested in um, metabolic profiling, for example, you can also find me there. Yeah, I wanted to, you know, well, I've, unfortunately, I, got to, I wanted to talk to you about erythritol a little bit or, so, you know, as, as one of the things, but maybe maybe on another time. But anyway, thank you very mm -hmm. much for doing this. We appreciate it. Folks, we'll see you guys back tomorrow. We'll get Elliot Overton tomorrow. Thanks, everybody. Have a great Thanks day. Thanks for inviting. Take care. Take care. Bye-bye now. Bye-bye.